like a model area one, it will complete touching number seven, complete uh, touching number one for the point A. So in this lecture, we're going to continue with uh, what we started last week which was going to be about the uh, other machining operations other than the turning milling and the uh, drilling operations. Also, we're going to talk about the tool life and the materials for the tools and also the cost in the machining processes. So the content of this lecture is going to be the other machining operation rather than the turning milling and the uh, drilling operation that we've covered earlier. Also, we're going to talk about the tool failure and the life of the tool and the different tool materials. And we are going to finish this uh, session today by talking about the machining cost we are going to achieve by using different cutting speeds. Now, other machining operation we are going to start with is going to be first the shaping and the planning. So you can see that um, the shaping and the planning that we have in this uh, image are going to be actually uh, similar operations. Uh, the difference between these two operations are going to be first that if the part is going to be moving and the cutting tool is going to be stationary or the cutting tool is moving like what we have in the case of the shaping and the part is going to be sort of stationary so if you can see that the concept is going to be the same we're going to use a single point cutting tool which is going to be moved linearly i.e that the cutting tool is going to move in f line movement now the part itself also going to be fed in a linear movement. So in the first case, we're going to talk about the shaping. The cutting tool is going forward and backward in oscillation movement. And this oscillation movement is going to remove the line of a material each time by a certain depth of cut. So I can see here that we're going to have the initial uh, 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 thickness of the uh, chip. And of course, we're going to have final different, uh, final different uh, thickness of the chip after the separation. The feed rate is going to be in the linear direction of the uh, cutting tool. And the part itself is going to have a feed motion which is going to be pushed from the left to the right. So each time we're going to set a certain value for the TO, and then the cutting tool will remove this layer until we're going to have a new surface. Now, in the case of the planning, uh, planning is going to be something similar to it, but the different is that the cutting tool is not going to be moving in oscillation movement. Instead of that, the part is going to be moving in this oscillation movement. Now, uh, in, in the case that the part is going to be moving on table forward and backward, the cutting tool is going to be set the depth of the cut for uh, this operation. Now, the machine uh, is known as the playing machine or uh, the, uh, well, uh, mainly is going to be known as the playing machine or shaping machine. You can see that the difference between them is not going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be obvious actually, it's not going to be something hard to be recognized. So for this machine, you can see that the bram is going to move forward, forward and backward, and this definitely going to move the cutting tool in this linear movement. So you can see that this is a shaper. In the case of the uh, uh, planer, we're going to say it next, the table is going to be moving forward and backward, but the cutting tool is going to be just fed in the direction of the cut. So a straight flat surface is going to be created in both operations. Uh, it's going to be interrupted cutting operation because the cutting tool is going to leave the part and come back to it once again. This will subject the tool to an impact loading when it's going to be entering the work each time. Typical tooling is going to be a single point with high, uh, made of the high-speed steel tool. Uh, low cutting tool uh, uh, speed due to the start and the stop motion. Now you can see that the planer is going to be a different uh, machine. The table is going to go forward and backward, and the cutting tool is going to be fed to set the, the uh, thickness of the cut. Different shape, different diameters also can be uh, used as a numerical control uh, movement. Okay, so uh, we go now with the other operation, which is quite similar to this operation, but is going to have a multiple teeth instead of single teeth. And this operation is called the approaching. Now in the approaching, uh, we're going to have, as you can see in this GIF video, uh, the single fed operation of the cutting tool will generate the uh, cut required. 
this cutting tool can be a uh, different cutting operation can be done internally or externally as you can see in this diagram what we are going to have in this cutting tool you can see that the th that the thickness of the uh, tool is going to increase as we're going upward so increasing cut diameter as we're going upward multiple tooth cutting tool is going to move linearly relative to the work in the direction of the tool axis what's happening if i'm going to have very close view is the following you can see that the first diameter is going to be the smaller so it's going to start to remove the first layer second tool will follow remove another layer third layer fourth layer so a single pass we're going to generate or form the the uh, shape of the cutting tool inversely inside the work part from the um, shape you can see here that you can see that we can have a different shape this can be very hard to be done by the drilling operation or even sometimes by the milling operation like for example we can have the square shape we can have the keyway double keyway fourth keyway the hexagonal shape okay uh, even something like the gear shape can be done by the approaching operation the advantage of the approaching operation is that we're going to achieve a good service finishing also, we're going to achieve very close tolerances. And also, we can have a variety of the work shape are going to be possible. The cutting tool is called the approach. And because it's going to be very complicated and open is going to be a custom shaped geometry, the tooling thus is going to be quite expensive. You can see that we have a different shape, and this can be externally or externally. Uh, uh, internally approaching or externally approaching processes to achieve the different geometries. Now, one of the most popular machining processes, and actually we can consider it as one of the oldest uh, machining processes, is the sewing. The sewing is going to cut uh, a narrow slit in the work by the tool consisting of the series of narrowly spaced teeth. The tool is called the saw blade. Typical functions for the two, uh, for the sewing operation is separate the work part into uh, two pieces. Also, it can cut off the unwanted portion of the part. Also, it can cut an outline of the flat parts. The machine we are using for this operation mainly is going to be the power hacksaw. Nobody is using the linear one. So uh, the linear responsibility motion of the half cell can uh, play it can, against the work and cause the removing of the material and thus we're going to separate the part. We also can have the band saw. The band saw is going to be linear continuous motion of the band saw blade, which is in turn is going to be the form of the endless flexible loop uh, with teeth on one edge. When we're going to send an endless, that means it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to have ends. Because you can see that the plate actually is going to be rotating continuously because it's connected it doesn't have and it's not separated parts <clears throat> also we can have the circle so which is rotating so plate provides continuous motion of the tool passing work part now machining operation for special geometries can be the screw thread and also for the machining of the gear teeth start with the cutting screw thread the method of producing the external threads are going to be other single point threading. We can do that actually using the threading machine. We can also using the threading dies, and that's what we are using, for example, the plumbing operation. Also, we can do the thread chasing using the self-opening threading dies, and finally, it's going to be the thread milling operation. The method for producing the internal threads can be done by the tapping, which is using the solid tap have this, uh, almost the same shape of the uh, turn that we would like to have. And then it's going to, we need to drill a hole first and then the tapping will finishing the operation or generating the threading internally. Also, we can use collapsible taps, which is going to be a cutting teeth retracted for the quick removal from the hole. And finally, of course, we can also use the uh, milling operation and the turning operation to generate the internal threads uh, inside the holes. So this is some example for the uh, internal screw threads by using the single point threading on the turning machine or by using the threading die. This operation also can show you the milling opera the turning operation and this one is a turning operation which can do the internal 
and excellent trading inside the pipe at the same time. We can also do threading, thread milling using the form uh, milling cutters. You remember the form milling cutters? Uh, we talked about this one. The shape of the cut we're going to have is going to be similar, but it's going to be a reverse shape of the uh, cutting tool. So in that case, we can simply going to uh, turn the pot. Uh, for those who attended the, um, uh, the lab session last week, we talked about something called the indexing tool or uh, the extra axis we have on the uh, milling machine table. So actually we can fix the part on the indexing uh, uh, table and start to rotate the part. At the same time, the cutting tool is start to rotate and then is going to be fed uh, in the direction of the cut. What we are going to have in the result is going to be the uh, thread milling operation. Now, another operation is very important, which is the machining of the gear teeth. Now, the machining of the gear teeth can be done with many operations. One of the operations is going to be similar to the one we saw above, which is going to be the form milling. And in that case, we are going to use the form milling cutters to cut an equal uh, division of the uh, circle. And thus, we are going to have the teeth generated around the uh, disc part. We also can do the process by using the gear hopping, which also using the uh, the milling, but it's also can use it for the special cutter, which is called the hop cutters. We can do the gear shaping, and this can be done by two forms, by using a single point tool that is gradually to shape each gear to the spacing, or we can use the cutter that have a general shape of the gear, but with the cutting teeth on one side. In both cases, for the gear shaping, now it's called shaping, we're going to have the process of the cutting tool is going to go forward and backward and also let him movement like what we have in the shaping operations uh, process and thus is going to generate the gear teeth now the last process is going to be the gear approaching now approaching is using something like the approach cutting tool i saw an example of that earlier uh, we're going to have the gear approaching uh, uh, cutting tool which is going to have cylindrical shape it's going to go in a single movement linearly and thus is going to generate the uh, teeth. Obviously, what we are going to say that we are going to have a different uh, diameters for the cutting tool internally uh, in, uh, at the lower part and the uh, final uh, part. And thus, in this movement, it's going to start to remove the layers continuously until we are going to have the final shape of the gear on the work part. So we start with the uh, form milling of the gear teeth. You can see that we're going to have the form uh, milling cutter. And the part is going to be moved by using the indexing uh, mesh, uh, tool. So you can see this is the indexing tool. It's moving to a certain position. Usually the indexing tool, you can set the number of the turns you would like to have. For example, if I would like to have 21 teeth. So it's going to divide the circle into 21 teeth. Now, of course, if I going to have 21 teeth for a large diameter, the cutting tool should be wider and thus is going to have larger teeth. The operation can be done uh, horizontally or vertically, depending on the type of the gear we are going to generate. <clears throat> the gear blank is going to be indexed between each pass to establish the correct size of the gear. Oh, sorry, this uh, looking so bad shape. Anyway. Uh, well, just give me one second, one second. I'll just try to uh, get rid of these uh, shadowy things. Uh, so just give me one second. I'm sorry for that, but it's always happened every time I save the, uh, the document, it starts to overlapping between the image and the text. I get to uh, try to avoid that now. Okay. Yeah, now it should be fixed. So I will go back uh, once again to the previous page just to show you what we were talking about. So the gear plank is going to be indexed between each pass to establish correct size of the gear tool. Now we're going for the gear hopping. And the gear hopper, you can see that the hopper is going to have multiple teeth. Once again, it's going to have a different shape, different diameters, and also at the end, it's going to uh, generate the final shape of the gear cut. Again, the part is going to be rotating between the indexing uh, tool 
as you can see in all these photos. The cutting tool is going to rotate in one direction and then it's going to uh, have a, a continuous movement with the work part. And that's why again to generate the uh, final shape of the uh, gear required. Okay, so uh, once again, the hope has uh, a slight helix and its, its rotation must be coordinated with much slower rotation of the gear plank. Uh, performed on special milling machines that call the hopping machines that accomplish the relative speeds and the feed motions between the cutter and the gear plank. The other operation is going to be the gear hopping. So you can see the cutting tool of the hopper is going to be something similar to what we're going to have in the case of the uh, uh, the previous one which was the hopping and now the difference is that we can see that the teeth diameter is, is going to be quite different again you can see that the hopper is going to have a rotation uh, the part is rotating slightly and thus we're going to generate the teeth one after the other the cutting tool all usual is going to be fed in this direction and the work part is fed on the rotational direction at the end we're going to achieve the shape of the gear Okay, now this is a closer image for the operation we are going to have. So, um, the other operation we can have is going to be the gear shaping. Now, in the gear shaping, the cutting tool is going to be removing any linear movement forward and backward. It's going to have, once again, a non-continuous cutting operation because the cutting tool is going to leave the part and come back to it once again. We're going to have an impact motion. You can see that the cutting tool, the cutter, is going to be indexing motion, and the work mod also going to have an indexing motion. So each time, we're going to have a fresh teeth to uh, be in contact with a fresh part. So in gear shaping, to start the process, the cutter is going to be gradually fed into the gear plank. Then the cutter and the plank are going to be slowly rotated after each stroke to maintain the tooth spacing. It performed on special machine that called the gear shaver. Now for the gear shaving operation, that's what we're going to have. Actually, you can see that both are going to be rotating in very slight movement to have a new face in contact. Okay, so that's what's happening actually in very close motion. You can see that in this area, we're going to have the part and the cutting tool going to start a contact. And by leaving the part, we're going to have almost the finished uh, teeth has been cut. Now the gear approaching is applicable for both external and uh, internal gears, of course, because this will depend on the teeth inside of the gear uh, direction. This image we have here is going to cutting the internal gear, or well, actually this will be a sprocket more rather than the gear. The cost of the tooling, once again, is going to be high due to the uh, complex geometry we have for it. For internal gears, the approach consists of a series of the gears shape cutting tool and of increasing size, as we mentioned earlier, from the gear teeth in successive steps as approach is going to be drawn through the starting pole. For external gears, the approach is going to be tubular with inward facing cutting teeth. Now, this is the operation of the Gear approaching. Now you can see that almost in all the operation we are going to require to have a very high uh, amount of the lubricant. Uh, lubricant of course is going to reduce the fraction and thus we are going to reduce the amount of the energy required for this operation. At the same time of course we are going to reduce the, uh, the energy we are going to use for this operation and the lubricant of course is going to reduce the possibility of having the damages for both the tool and the cutting tool. Uh, now, CNC machining uh, on Prag B is going to be due this week. Uh, the activity is going to be found in the Prag B uh, in the handbook. I will try to upload a tutorial for you on how to write down the G code for the part we have in this session. Uh, the program for the CNC code for the turning is going to be done for the uh, week after. I'm oh, sorry, it's going to be uh, in the other session. And the reading is going to be for Prague B uh, notes uh, in the Prague handbook. And once again, you need to fill the document, uh, the sheet, and uh, uh, upload it. 
remember that this sheet is going to contain uh, a G coding for four parts. Uh, you need to do that yourself. Okay, you need to do that yourself. For the student who cannot attend this session for reason or another, maybe if they're going to have the COVID with uh, a medical certificate, you need to apply for a special concentration and again to run the online session for you. For a student who are overseas, uh, also we're going to have the same case. We're going to run the session for you online by using the CNC simulator uh, simulation tool. Now, uh, another operation we need to worry about is going to be the tool failure and the tool life. In all the cases, I don't want to change the tool every five minutes or change the tool after cutting a single part. So one of the reasons of using lubricant was try to increase the tool life. Okay, the tool life. So let's have a look about what we having regarding this topic. Now, usually we have a three failure mode for the tool. This failure mode is going to be first a fracture failure. So while you do the cutting, the cutting tool suddenly is going to be broken. Now, this can be due to many reasons. For example, the impact or the extra forces that affecting the, uh, the cutting tool, and this will cause it to break up at any time using the cutting tool. Now, the other failure we have is going to be a temperature failure. What's happening is that the cutting temperature is going to be too high for the tool material to stand. So it's start to be smooth and thus is going to be banded. And the third mode we're going to have is going to be the gradual wear. Gradual wear is going to have gradual wearing of the cutting tool tip. So it's going to start to lose the material gradually until we're going to have that the size of the cutting tool is going to be smaller or, of course, we're going to have a different dimension for this cutting tool. Now, the difference between these three different modes of the failure is going to be the fracture can be happen suddenly. At any time, you may set the depth of the cut inside the work part at very high speed suddenly then we're going to have the brittle fracture to occur. Temperature failure, you forgot to add the, uh, the cooling uh, fluid and the cutting tool is going to have a continuous contact with the work part and this will generate a very high fraction uh, rate and thus we're going to have a very high temperature and the tool will fail. The gradual wear is going to start with using the cutting tool with a proper depth of the cut for the material again cut to cut and also using the correct speed and the force on the cutting tool but the cutting tool will gradually wear so it's going to take its time until it's going to be fell now among these three cases the gradual wear is going to be one preferable because you can estimate that time so the preferred mode is going to be the gradual wear the fracture and the temperature failures are going to be premature failures can be happening at any time. Maybe it's going to be happening in the first minute of your uh, using of your cutting tool. You, do, you always try to avoid that. The gradual way is going to be performed, preferred because it's going to lead for the longest possible use of the tool. The gradual wear, oh, I have the overlapping again. The gradual wear uh, occurs usually on the flank. Uh, sorry, because in two uh, locations of the tool, the flank wear and the uh, crater wear. And we're going to have an image for the uh, both the crater and the flank. Now, the flank means something like the side. Okay, flank means the side. In Germany, actually, it's called the wing. Uh, so, uh, if I'm going to take a look for the flank, of course, it's going to be the side area. So usually the flank wheel is going to be the hardest. And because we're going to have the fraction due to the contact of the chip with the cutting tool, we're going to have the crater wheel. So uh, the worn cutting tools uh, showing the principal location and types of the wheel occurs can be found in this diagram. And if I'm going to show you an image instead of the uh, diagram, I can show you that. So once again, at the top, we're going to have the crater wheel. 
and on this side we are going to have the flank rear and uh, actually this cutting tool is a cemented carbide tool uh, well and this photo actually has been taken by Lee University in Sweden and you can see the effect of uh, this operation now we always if I get to have such shape we're going to lose the sharpness of the cutting tool and that's something we need to avoid uh, in most of the operation because if I get to lose sharpness that's when I get to use more energy to perform the cutting. Now <clears throat> the tool wheel is going to be a function of time. So in this diagram we can see that the tool wheel with the time as the tool wheel as a function of the cutting time ex expanded into divided into three main stages. The first one is going to be the break-in period. When you start to cut using the cutting tool, you will have a rapid initial wear on the surface. A, a, a top layer will be removed suddenly in a very short time. Then we're going to have a slower rate of the wear, which is called the uniform wear rate. And this will take a longer time as a steady state wear region. And a certain level, again, to have an accelerating wear rate because the material has lost most of its properties. The dimension has become too small to take more forces. So we're going to have a fair region where the, uh, the wear is going to be accelerating and then we're going to have the sudden final failure of the cutting tool. So just imagine if I going to have <clears throat> this time of the cutting tool to be five hours you'll indicate that you need to change the cutting tool at four hours or four and a half hours. And thus you are going to prevent any sudden failure for the cutting tool due to the fraction or the uh, temperature failure of the tool that may damage the work part and damaging your machine at the same time. Of course, it's going to be hazard uh, possibility. Now, the other effects of the uh, tool is going to be the cutting speed. Higher cutting speed will reduce the tool life. We can see in this diagram the effects of the cutting speed on the tool flank wheel for three cutting speeds using the tool life creation of 0.5 millimeter flank wheel. So you can see that we have the function the time one, time two, time three. And we're going to have different time of the cutting going to be achieved. If I can to use the cutting tool at the, high, at the speed of the cutting of 160 millimeter per minute with the depth cut, uh, the, sorry, the, um, uh, the flank wheel of 0.5 millimeter is going to be achieved in five minutes. If I can to reduce the cutting speed to 130, the tool life is going to be increased to 12 minutes. If I get to drop it down to 100 meter per minute, the tool life will be extended to 41 minutes. Now, actually, this operation uh, has been done in the lab intensively, and they came out with what we call the tool life is cutting speed on a natural log to log plot of the cutting speed with the tool life. We came out with this diagram. So we change it to a linear relationship. In this relationship, we're going to have the relation between the velocity and the tool life. Three points. And from three points, we can do a th further calculation to find what we call the Taylor's tool life equation. Taylor, Taylor uh, tool life equation tell us that the velocity of the cutting or the speed of the cutting multiplied by the tool life up to power n is equal to a constant where the parameter r the v is the cutting speed in meter per minute t is the tool life in minutes the n and the c are parameters that been dependent on the feet depth of the cut the work material we use the tool uh, the cutting tool material and the tool life creation used so mostly most of these parameters the n and the c can be found from the log to log uh, to life diagram. What well, the n is going to be the slope of the log of the t up to power n is equal to c over v, and the n multiplied by the log of the t is going to be equal to the minus log item of the speed 
plus the logarithm of the C constant. The C is going to be the intercept uh, on the speed axis at one minute to life. The relationship is, has been created by Frederick W. Taylor. So the value for the N and of course the C are going to be uh, depending once again on the tool material. For example, for the high speed steel can have the value for the N to be equal to 0.1. For the tungsten carbide insert, we can have it as 0.25. For the ceramic cutting tool, it's going to be increased to 0.6. So usually, um, it's going to be a cutting speed that's going to be the most important overall property. Higher speed, we're going to reduce the tool life. That's standard. So we have some standard cutting speed for different cutting materials. For example, for the carbon steel, the V value is going to be about 5 meter per minute. The high speed steel will increase to 30. The centered carbide insert is going to be 150. And for the ceramic, it's going to go up to 600 meter per minute. The typical values for the N and the C, and this can be found in the table 19.2 for your textbook. Uh, once again, depending on the two materials for the high speed steel, if I get use it for the non-steel work, cutting is going to have the value of 4.125. The C value will be up to 120 meter per minute. And uh, for the steel work, the N is going to remain the same because the cutting tool is still the same, but the material is going to be steel, which is going to be harder. So the C value will be reduced to 70 meter per minute. For the similar carbide, the N is going to be 0.25. For non-steel work, we're going to have the C value up to 900 meter per minute. For the steel work, is going to be dropped to 500 meter per minute. For the ceramic, the N value is going to be 0.6. For the steel work, the C value is going to be 3000. Usually for the ceramic, you cannot use it for non-steel work. And in addition, you cannot use the ceramic cutting tool for the rough operation. It only can be used for the finishing operation. Now, the two life criteria in the production are complete failure of the cutting edge, the visual inspection of the wheel by the machine operator. Also, you can use your fingernail test across the cutting edge to see that if we're going to have actually a failure start to occur. We're going to hear changes in the sound emitted from the operation. Usually it's going to be something like a whistle. The chips will become stringy and difficult to dispose. We're going to have degradations of the service finishing. We will notice that there will be an increased power consumed for the cutting operation. And also the workpiece count will be lowered and the cumulative cutting time will be resulted. Well, I can tell you that that's what's happening if I'm going to use a cutting tool that is not sharp enough. Now we're going to have an example for the tool life. And this example, once again, is going to be a part of the assignment number three that will be released very soon. We have a machining steel with tungsten carbide tool. The tool life of 40 minutes is going to be achieved at the cutting speed of one meter per second. First, find the distance traveled by the tool before it has to be replaced. Distant. Traveled by the tool before it has been replaced. I'll give you a hint about that. Also, what will be the tool life and the distance when the cutting speed is going to be doubled? Now, to give you a hint about that, we're only going to use the Taylor equation and some basic physics principles. So we have tungsten carbide, so we can find the N and the C. The tool life is 40 minutes, so we've been given the T. And the cutting speed is given as 1 meter per second. Just remember that this time needs to be changed into a meter per minute. So we have, we have the uh, T, uh, sorry, the V, multiplied by the T up to power N is equal to constant. We need to find the distance traveled by the tool before it has to be replaced. Now we have here two relationship. We have the time of the tool life and we have the, uh, the cutting speed in meter per second. Now you know that actually the, the, 
this time. It's going to be a relation between the time of the traveling and the speed of the traveling. Later, when we're going to find that, we can use the TV, uh, the, the V1, T1 up to power N is equal to the V2, T2 up to power N because it's going to be equal to a constant. And that's why we're going to solve for the part number two. So for the solution, the distance traveled by the tool is equal to the speed multiplied by the time. Now remember that the speed we have on one meter per second. And the time we have is in a minute. So we need to change either to unify the units to two seconds or two minutes. So in our example here, we are going to say that one meter per second is the speed multiplied by 40 meter per minute, which is going to be the time of the traveling, multiplied by 60 seconds for every minute. So if I'm going to multiply these values, one times 40 is 40, 40 times 60 is 2,400 meter. It's the distance that the cutting tool is going to be traveled during this 40 minutes. Now we need to calculate what will be the time of the traveling if the speed is going to be double to two meter per seconds. So we're going to use the Taylor equation that the speed multiplied by T up to power N is equal to constant. Then V1 is equal to one meter per second. T1 is equal to 40 meter per second, per minute, uh, 40 minutes, sorry. The V2 is equal to two meter per second. Then the G2 is going to be unknown. So the equation can be written as the following is continuity equation because both is going to be equal to a constant. So V1 T1 up to power N is equal to V2 T2 up to power N, where the N for the carpal is equal to 0.25 meters. So to solve that, we're going to write down the equation as the following. The T2 is equal to T1 multiplied by the V1 divided by the V2 up to power 1 over n. Now here, we said that we know the T1, the V1, the V2, and the n value, which is 0.25. So if I'm going to substitute the values, I will end up with the time is going to be reduced to 2.5 minutes only. So just imagine, just double the speed will reduce the time from 40 minutes to 2.5 minutes Thus, the distance is going to be traveled in that case is going to be equal to the speed of the cutting multiplied by the new tool life multiplied by 60, which is going to be 300 meters. So you can see that the lower cutting speed will, reduce, will result in using the tool life for longer time. The high speed will reduce that for a short time. But we cannot always use the cutting tool to cutting at lower speed because this will increase the time of the machining and thus the cost of the machining. So we always can use the Taylor equation to optimize, to calculate the optimum time we can use for this uh, process. Now we go for the second part, the cutting conditions and the tool life. So once again, the factor will affect in the tool life is going to be the cutting speed, the feed rate, and the depth of the cut. Of course, the cutting speed, we saw that the cutting speed is going to be a parameter of the, one of the main parameters to decide the tool life. But once again, the feed rate and the depth of the cut will make another decision for the factor affecting the tool life because this is going to add a forces on the cutting tool. So an example is a given tool and materials and the work materials we have. If I'm going to increase uh, the speed by 50%, we're going to have 90% decreases in the tool life. If we're going to have 50% increase in the feed rate, we're going to have 60% decrease in the tool life. If I'm going to increase the depth of the cut by 50%, again to reduce the tool life by 15%. So maximize the depth of the cut and the feed rate for most economical effect strategy. The tool failure modes identify the important properties that the tool material should be possessed. So these properties 
are going to be uh, the, the best properties for the tool, cutting tool is going to be first, the material should have a good toughness to avoid the fracture of failure, especially when we get to have um, a discontinuous uh, cutting operation. Hot hardness, which is the able to retain the hardness at high temperature. So the material is going to have a high hot, high, hot hardness. That means it's going to keep itself hard. Even the temperature is going to be increasing, so it's not going to change to be soft. Also, it should have a wheel resistance. Well, the hardness is going to be the most important property to resist the abrasive wear. So we start first with the hot hardness. These are some typical hot hardness relationship for the selected tool materials. So this is the hardness using the Rockwell hardness factor, which is C, unit less. And the temperatures, these temperatures are in Fahrenheit. So we start first with the plain carbon steel. The plain carbon steel is going to be too soft when the temperature is going to be reaching the uh, 800 Fahrenheit. The next type was the cast cobalt, sorry, the, it was the uh, high speed steel. The high speed steel have high hardness, so it can resist the hot hardness much better. So you can see it's going to uh, affect it less than what we have on the plain carbon steel to the higher temperature. The new materials like the cast cobalt alloys have a more stability at higher temperature. The cemented carbide is even better and then the ceramic coming to be the best. Now the problem is that this cutting tool cannot cutting all the materials and this will be one of the problems we have to aware about when we start to selecting the cutting tool. A typical hot, part, uh, a typical hot hardness relationship for the selected tool materials is showing in this diagram. The high speed steel is going to be much better than the plain steel. The similar carbide and the ceramic are going to be the harder at elevated temperatures. Other characteristics that uh, play an important part or role in the tool wear and machining efficiency are first, the hardness, the hot hardness, strength to resist the bulk deformation, the chemical stability, the high elastic modulus, and the consistent tool life. Finally, the correct geometry and the service machine for the cutting tool. Types of the uh, we mode can be found in the following uh, website, the machining efficiency self.com slash tool uh, wear photos uh, HTML. Now let's have a look for the different tools that you uh, tool materials that use in the industries uh, we have. So first we are going to start with the high speed steel. Because the carbon steel is uh, it's become very rare to be used. Maybe it's used on some of the hobby machining processes because it's quite cheap, but it's not going to be very useful for the uh, mass manufacturing processes. So we start with the high speed steel, the HSS or the HS, is a highly alloyed tool steel capable of the machining hardness at elevated temperatures. This can work better than the high carbon steel and the low alloy steels. Especially suited for the application involving the complicated tool shapes like the drills, the tabs, the milling cutters, and the approaches. Two basic types of the high speed steel single sin type, which is designated as the T grades, and we have the multipedinium type, which is designated as the M grades. So, next time when you try to buy a cutting tool, even if it's going to be called drilling tip, you will see that they will be written as T grades or the M grades. This will depend on what we're mixing with the steel. Typical alloy ingredients are going to be, of course, the carbon is going to be a ma mainly for all the steel uh, cutting tools. Uh, Tingerson and all the molybdeniums, the chromium and the molybdeniums, and sometimes we're going to use some cobalt in some grades. Typical compositions for the uh, grade T is going to be 18% for the tungsten, 4% for the chromium, 1% for the molybdeniums, and 0.9% for the carbon. This 
is an alloy steel with various additive materials to improve the temperatures, properties, and the toughness of the cutting tool. Tinkerson based alloys are going to be the most popular and the multiple units are going to be used to improve the toughness. Some steel use both the Tinkerson and the multiple units at the same time, as well as the carbon. Uh, it's cobalt, sorry. Hardness at room temperature is going to be about 66%, uh, 66 rot bomb number, while at 550 centigrade is going to be down to 57 centigrade. Above 600 percent a degree is going to be uh, false rapidly. So the alloying compositions for the common high speed steel with a great uh, by percent weight can be found in this table. So you can see that the grades can be the uh, Tingerson, Multivium 2, Multivium 7, and 35, and M42. We can see that the main changes is going to be first in the Multiviums, and then in the Tingerson value, we're going to have in both of them. Now, the selection of the highest speed is still, uh, it's going to be either the basic W or the MO types, which is going to be a combination of the hardness and the toughness. General purposes is going to be for the drill and the end nodes. The high cobalt type, which is going to contain up to 12% cobalt, is going to have a hot hardness and the wear resistance at the expenses of the toughness. It's good for the heavy cuts, high speed for difficult materials like the alloy steels. Uh, the high, uh, sorry, we have an overlapping again. So just let me fix that as we go. Okay, so I'm going to expand that a little bit. Okay, so we said that the last type is going to be built in ties. It's going to have 10% as a percentage of the weight. It's going to be best for the wheel resistance uh, at the expenses of the hot hardness and the toughness. So that means we are going to not going to be able to work very high temperature, but it's going to have best wood resistance. Finishing operation is going to be the most application for these cutting tools, like the finish turning of the, ca of the cast iron. Now, the other material we can use for making the cutting tool is going to be the sensitive carbides. So the sinus cover is made by a different operation. It's not going to be melted material that's going to be uh, casted then uh, machined to have a shape of the cutting tool. Instead of that, we're going to have the powder materials using the Tinkerson carbide uh, mixed with the cobalt as a binder. So we're going to mix these two powders, compact them, then we're going to put them in the furnace. They're going to be solidified. And thus, we can they're going to be too hot to use them as cutting tools. Two basic types which is going to be first the non steel cutting grades, uh, which can have only the Tingerson and the carbide, and also we can have the steel cutting grades, which is going to have the Tingerson carbide with the TIC and TAC added to uh, the Tingerson carbide. TI is the titanium, uh, the TA is the tethelium. Te te the WC is the Tingerson carbide, and the CO is the cobalt. So these alloys usually going to come in a form of the tip inserts with a multiple cutting edges. So uh, when one edge is going to be where another can be used without replacing the whole tool. Okay, sorry for the overlapping again. Okay, now they are formed by a powder metrology and thus it can be recycled. So you can see that the cutting tool itself can be made for the high speed steel, but they're not going to do the cut. These small tips are going to be the cutting edges. So this is a circular saw plate with Tinkerson carbide insert. This can be simply glued by something like the super glue on the top of the on the tip of the cutting tool and they're going to perform the cutting. Now sometimes we said once again if one of the edges is going to be where this can be used without replacing the whole tool. Well the carbide inset that using at the cutting tool, the one which have the baklava shape, actually we can tend it to have an eight different edges. Now the general properties of the standard carbide are first 
high compressive strength but low to moderate tensile strength. It have a high hardness, 90 to 95 uh, HRA. We remember that it was 66 for the high speed steel. Good hot hardness, good wear resistance, high thermal conductivity, high elastic modulus of elasticity up to 600 multiplied by 10 up to 3 megapascal. Also, its toughness is going to be lower than the high speed steel. For the non steel cutting carbide grades, it's used for the non ferrous metals and the gray cast iron. Non ferrous metal like the aluminium, the, the brass, the copper, or whatever material is going to be. Properties in mind by the grain size and the cobalt contained. Now, grain size because that this material is powder metrology. So simply we can control the grain size depending on the uh, property we would like to achieve. Uh, okay, just give me one second. I'll just try to, to fix that somehow. So uh, once again, the non steel uh, cutting carbide grades is used for the non ferrous metals and gray cast iron. The probably is mind by the grain size and the cobalt content. The, as the grain size is going to be increased, we are going to have hardness and hard hardness to be decreased. But we are going to have toughness to be increased. As the cobalt content is going to be increased, we are going to have the toughness improves at the expenses of the hardness and the wear resistance. Now, for the uh, steel cutting carbide insert, usually it's going to be used for the low carbon and stainless steel and other alloy steels. Uh, the uh, titanium and the titanium are going to be substituted for some of the carbide uh, insert. The compos composition increases the greater wear resistance for the steel cutting, but adversely, it's going to be effective flank wear resistance for the non steel cutting applications. Now, how to select the center carbides? If I'm going to use the tungsten carbide, the cobalt is going to be good for fast uh, irons and non ferrous metals, but it's not going to be suitable for the steels at the high speeds due to the diffusion. Wait. Uh, for the tungsten, uh, titanium, uh, and cobalt mixture, uh, no diffusion wear is going to be occurred, but we're going to have less choke resistance. Sometimes we all need to coat the carbides. So we don't have to have the full cutting tool to be made of the cobalt. These are going to be very similar base materials at the center of carbide, but it's going to have an addition are going to be coated. And this coat, uh, coating is going to be done by what we call the chemical vapor depositions. With a thin layer of the carbides and the nitrides of the titanium or the sphurium uh, and the ceramics, which is going to cause the aluminum oxide. So this extra layer we can have on the top is going to give it a more pro strength properties uh, for this material. Oh, sorry, so the thing has been jumped up. Okay, so um, once again, the operation we're talking about, which we're calling the, the vapor uh, deposition, is done in special furnaces where we're basically going to uh, Increase the temperature, and uh, we are going to have something like um, uh, no air uh, um, environment, and thus the ions is going to be evaporated, and it's going to be deposited at the top and adding this layer. Uh, it's used extensively in the industry because they are going to be custom made to suit the particular materials or the machine applications. So actually, that's what we're going to see exactly. If I get to have a microscopic view, that's what we're going to see. A layer has been uh, uh, deposited on the top of the cutting tool. This layer is going to be a titanium layer, which is going to give it a high strength for the cutting tool. And thus, we're going to have a better property for our cutting tool. Now we go with the uh, ceramic cutting tool. Now, this will be almost the last one we have. The ceramic are going to be quite new tool materials and are going to be formed once again by the powder metrology as for the carbide tools 
but it's going to be consist of the aluminium oxide base. Excellent for the hot hardnesses, low coefficient or fraction, it's going to have some brittleness, negative rake angle and large two nose radius to reduce the tensile stresses. And also it's going to reduce the feeds to minimize the short loads. The synthetic diamonds is synthetic polycrystalline diamonds. So it's not actual diamond, but it's going to have the powder of the diamond. It's going to be compressed at very high temperature, and thus is going to be very fine grain diamonds crystals. And using the temperature and the high pressure, it's going to have a desired shape with a little on or binders to be added. Usually apply as a coating of 0.5 millimeter thickness on the tungsten carbide cobalt inserts. The application is for the high speed machining of the non ferrous metals and the abrasive non metals such as the fiberglass reinforced polymers, the graphites, and the woods. Not suitable for the steel cutting. Now, to replace that, we can use a cubic boron nitride. Next to the diamond is going to be the hardest material known. The fabrication into the cutting tool insert, same as, as the SPD. We are going to act as a coating layer uh, at the top of the thickest and carbide insert. The application is going to be machining of the steel and the nickel based alloy that the uh, synthetic uh, poly, uh, carbide diamonds can, uh, sorry, the synthetic diamonds cannot cut. The problem is that the SPD and the CBN tools are very expensive. Now the tool geometry. The two main geometries we have for the cutting tools are the single point cutting tools, which use in the turning, the boring, the shaping, and the planing operation. And we have the multiple cutting edge cutting tools, like the one we're using for the drilling operation, uh, the beaming, the tapping, the milling, the forging, and the sewing. So uh, this will be the example of the single point cutting tool for those students who um, attended the lab once again. I think you saw this one uh, in the close. So you can see that what we're trying to do usually is to minimize the contact area between the cutting tool and the work part. That's simply going to increase the pressure at that point because you know the pressure is actually equal to the force divided by the area. So we need to play with the single point tool geometry with the seven elements of the single point geometry, which are the, uh, the, edge, uh, the end cutting edge angle, the side cutting edge angle, the side break angle, the side relief angle, the end relief angle, and of course the back rear rake angle. All these parameters are going to reduce the contact area and thus we are going to have the best uh, pressure of the tool on the work part and that's why again to use of course less force to achieve the same cutting operation <clears throat> now uh, the cutting tool usually is going to be consists of the cutting tool itself and the shank where well, the shank is going to be the part that the cutting tool will be held from on the tool post so the holding and the presenting on the single point cutting tool is going to have first the either the solid shank tool, which usually going to be made all of the high speed steel. If I get to use the carbide insert, I can use the shank to be made of carbon fibers or the high speed steel, and then I get to insert a brace to the tool shank at the top there. This will be cemented carbide insert. I'm going to use it when the life is finished. I can simply take it out by using the force and replace it with a new one. The shank is going to be reusable. To increase the efficiency and reduce the time of the uh, tool changing, I can use the mechanical clamp insert, which is used for the cemented carbide or the ceramic or any other very hard tool materials. And again, to use the tool holder of the shank, uh, which can uh, is going to be reusable. I can change either the insert or change the direction of the cutting tool, and use the uh, same shank continuous time. Common ins common insert shapes for the cutting tools can be the round, the square, the rhombus with eighty degree 
point angles, the hexagon with 80 degree point angles, triangle shape, the rhombus with 55 degree point angles, and the rhombus with 35 degree point angles. So you can see that the shape is going to be affecting the following. If I'm going to move from the A to the G, I'm going to increase the versatility and the accessibility. Because this one is going to be narrow and long, so it's going to have more accessibility. But the thin shape is going to have less strength, more power requirement, and vibration tendency. If I'm going to go for the thicker shape or the more uh, called, called the solid shape, it's going to actually improve these properties. <clears throat> so these are some of the collection of the metal cutting inserts with various geometries made of various materials. Uh, as you can see that the cutting shape can be any shape and you can control that because simply they're going to be made by the pattern methodology. So the shape of the mold we're going to have, it will decide what will be the shape of the cutting tool we're going to achieve. Now for the twisted drawl, which is another cutting tool we are uh, usually using. Most common uh, cutting tools are going to be for the hole making, usually made of the high speed steel. Shown below is the standard twist drill geometry. You can see that if I'm going to take a look from the front, I'm going to have the chisel edge, and we're going to have the cutting edge is going to be on the side. The whip thickness is one of the most important parameters we have for this cutting, for the cutting tool. And here we have a margin of the cuts which we're going to actually push the uh, chip as we as the cutting tool is going to be moving and that's what the margin we have usually the float is going to be very important parameters because it's going to be required to push the chip out as the cutting tool is going in twist drill operation is rotation and the feeding of the drill bit results in a relative motion between the cutting edges and the work material to form the chip the cutting speed varies along the cutting edge as a function of the distance from the axis of the rotation. Relative velocity at the drill point is going to be zero, so not, no cutting takes place in the middle. Instead, a large thrust force is going to be required to drive the drill forward into the hole. So that's why when you do the drilling, usually again to push harder first, and then the force required later to be less, because the chip will start to uh, revolt. Now the problem we have is going to be the chip removal. The fluids must provide a sufficient clearance to allow the chip to move from the bottom of the hole during the cutting. So the problem is that the chip is going to have a contact with the uh, fluids wall, and this will cause a fraction to, uh, to occur. So the fraction makes the uh, matter worse, the rubbing between the outside diameter of the drill bit and the newly formed hole and the delivery, delivery of the cutting fluid to the drill point is going to reduce the friction and the heat is going to be difficult because the chip are going to be moving in the opposite direction. Alternatively, we can use the straight flow a fluid uh, cutting tool. So you can see that the fluid is not going to be continuously as what we have in the original shape. Instead of that, we're going to have the continuous float, large one, the, it's going to have enough space to uh, chip to be removed, as well as we're going to have the uh, uh, the enough space for the coolant fluid to run in. Now the problem we have with this type is going to be that only limited for a higher uh, diameter value for the holes. Alternative type is going to be the uh, gun and drill. Now the gun and drill type is going to have a hole in the middle. And this hole in the middle will start to push the coolant fluid from the end to the front, and thus it's going to push the chip to the outside. This is usually going to be used for the deep holes, as it has a carbide cutting edges, a single straight float, and the coolant hole running its entire length. Another type of the alternative drill is going to be the spader drill, and this is usually going to be used for the large diameters which can go up to six inches or 152 millimeters. The shape is going to be quite uh, simple. We're going to have the bigger plate uh, connected to the plate holder. We can change that continuously. 
And again, they have the chip splitter, and again, they have the brake face on the side here. With this movement, it's going to remove the chip and take it out because the area, uh, the whole diameter is going to be quite high, and thus the, uh, the chip will have an escape uh, to the outside. Now, some uh, milling cutters also can be uh, discussed here, which is because we're going to have multiple teeth in that case. The principal types are going to be the plain milling cutters, the fence milling cutters, and the end milling cutters, as we mentioned earlier. For the plain milling cutters, once again, multiple edges cutting tools. You can see that we're going to have the multiple edges, we're going to have the fillet in the middle, and we're going to have multiple cutters like the cutter diameters and the uh, the inside diameters. Uh, we're going to, we must have some clearance angle uh, to avoid uh, the accumulation of the chip on, on this side. And uh, we have the relief angle between the multiple teeth to, once again, to allow the coolant flow to run in and to provide an escape uh, for, the, uh, for the chip. So the two geometry elements of the 18 uh, tooth cutting tool this one is 18 to the full screen, we show in this diagram. Uh, further details is going to be for the face milling. Now for this face milling cutting, cutting tool, usually it's not going to be used to generate geometries. It's only going to be generating a flat surfaces. Two geometry elements or the four tool face milling cutters is going to be shown here. A is going to be the side of view and B is going to be the bottom view. Once again, you can see that we have a multiple teeth number, and this will be required actually to calculate the force we're going to have. If you remember the N value, which is going to be the number of the teeth we have uh, for uh, the cutting uh, tool. Now, the most common one is going to be the end milling cutters. Look like a drill bit, but it's going to be designed for the primary cutting with its peripheral teeth. The application is going to be used for the face milling. It's going to be do the profile milling and the pocketing. Uh, it's going to be cutting a slots. It can do the engraving. It's going to do the surface countering and do the die sinking. The cutting fluids are very important. Any fluid or gas applied directly to the machining operation to improve the cutting performance is going to be called the cutting fluid. Two main problems addressed in the cutting fluid. First, the heat generation at the shear and the fraction zones. Also, the fraction at the tool chip and the tool work interface. Other functions and benefits are going to be for the cutting tools. More than cooling and reducing the fraction, it's going to be washing away the chips, as we mentioned earlier. Reduce the temperature of the work part to increase the handling. Also, improve dimensional stability of the work part because very high temperature work part this will tend to expand in size, and then it's going to be cooled down. And that's why we're going to lose any uh, uh, accuracy in the machining process. The cutting fluid can be classified according to their functions. This can be either a coolant fluid, coolant cutting fluid, which mainly designed to reduce the effects of the heat in the machine. Usually it's going to be a water-based, and uh, most effective at high cutting speeds where the heat generation and the high temperature are going to be the problem. Most effective on tool materials that are going to be most susceptible to the temperature failures, for example, in the high speed steel. Oh, once again, overlap. I start to hate that. Now, just believe that I'm doing that every time I'm using this slide and save it, but later it's just keep coming back. Okay, so it's either going to be a coolant or it can be a lubricant. Now, lubricant usually is going to be designed to reduce the fraction between the tool chip and the tool work. Usually going to have an oil-based fluids, most effective at lower cutting speed, but also going to reduce the temperature in the operation. Now, the main problem we have with the cutting fluid is going to be the contamination. For example, we're going to have the trump oil, the garbage, the small chips, the molds and the fungus and the bacteria, especially if we're going to have it as a water based. Now, how to deal with the cutting fluid contamination? First, we can replace the cutting fluid at the regular and the frequent intervals. 
Also use the filtration system to continuously or periodically cleaning the fluid. And finally, we can do the dry machining. Now, most of the video we have uh, as the, uh, for example, they, they try to show you how the cutting is happening on the milling machine. by using what we call the dry machining. So no coolant fluid is going to be used. The problem we have with the uh, dry machining is going to be the increasing of the friction and the temperature. And that's why we're going to reduce the tool life and we're going to lose the uh, dimensional properties. Now, the cutting fluid filtrations, the advantage is going to be prolonged cutting fluids live between the changes, reduce the fluid disposal cost, uh, cleaner fluids reduce the health hazards, and also it's going to reduce the machine tool maintenance and we are going to achieve a longer tool life. Now, we said once again for the dry machining, no cutting fluids are going to be used, avoid the problems of the cutting fluid contamination, disposal, and the filtration. And the problem that we have with the dry machine is going to be first the overheating of the tool, the operating at lower cutting speed and the production rates to prolong the tool life, and the absence of the chip removal benefits of the cutting fluids and the grinding and the milling operation. Now, I will leave this section for uh, another session because I don't want you to watch a very long uh, uh, recording. Uh, from the previous recording we had, the most important example which was the using of the Taylor equation. We are going to have more application in the uh, tutorial, and we are going to see how we can use these, uh, this equation to calculate tool life and the other parameters. And we are going to have one equation in the assignment and one equation in the final exam using this application. Thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you soon.